so much. <laughs> yeah, I think they put the C in so it's not ass. <laughs> I was looking at it. <laughs> it's A-C-A-C-S-S. -S. I was just looking at the acronym for it. I, I remember when that was being started up uh, and uh, I think I was on, on something in the LEGB at the time. And I actually think that there was a discussion of precisely. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> it was a good yeah. move, whoever decided. <laughs> yeah. Camera off. Oh. Okay, great. So we're now live on YouTube, everyone. And I will do the introduction here in uh, about a minute. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, we're still just going to let a few more people in here. We all give an intro here in about a few seconds. We're up to almost 200 people here. We also have a number of people watching on uh, YouTube, which is now live. So thank you for uh, joining there. Everything will be um, will be stored on YouTube as well. So, um, you know, you can come back and look at it later. Uh, we've had a ton of um, views of Ted's talk already there. So we had about 800 views there in the past week, which is great. Um, I'm going to get started and then, you know, as people come in, um, you know, we will just keep going here. We'd like to kind of get get going here on time just so we can um, have a nice long discussion period. So anyways, uh, welcome back to the Birmingham Lectures. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with you guys all. Um, this is our second um, in, in our five part series on our on our sort of theme of language structure and language use. And I'm uh, really very happy to welcome Adele Goldberg here from uh, Princeton uh, to join us today. I'm going to um, introduce Adele. Um, as well as the panel in a second. I just wanted to kind of quickly just make a few quick notes because we've been improving things since last week, I, I think at least on the sort of user experience. So the um, the question um, and answer is open as is the chat. So you should be able to not just ask us questions or, or Adele questions, but you should be able to see each other's questions. So, so sorry about that last time. Um, the audience size should also be accessible to you. I mean, that's turned on, but I just do not for the life of me. I've, I've been on your side of it now and I don't actually know where to see that, but we'll give updates there too. Uh, currently we're at 242 in the room. Um, we can't give you full video access like as, a, as an audience member. I just wanted to quickly explain that and just say that the reason why is because we're on a webinar license here. So, you know, we're pushing up over 300 people and we wouldn't be able to do that on a, on a regular uh, meeting license. Um, but anyway, um, but, but otherwise I think you should have um, better access this week. Um, you should also be able to once 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 you go into presentation mode, you should be able to um, slide uh, the view so that you can maximize the size of the interpreter if you want. Okay, so just be clear about that. You should have that control. There should be a bar in the middle that you can move if you want the interpreter as well as Adele to be larger and, and the actual slides to be smaller. But I think that's about all you get in terms of control. Um, we're also very much encouraging live tweeting. Uh, we had some great tweeting last week. Um, if you do, it'd be great if you use the Brumlex hashtag. Um, we will, um, you know, retweet that as well. Um, great. Um, let me just then go ahead and introduce our panel, and then I'll introduce Adele. Um, so I'm just looking at my own screen here. We have um, Dagmar Diviak from from our department. Um, she'll be speaking in a couple of weeks. We have um, David Adger here from Queen Mary. Um, he'll be speaking next week on um, grammar and language use, a minimalist view. So I think that'll be a really interesting contrast with uh, this week. Um, we have Ted Gibson here who spoke last week. That was a great talk. Please go check that out if you haven't seen it yet. And we have um, Martin Hasselmath, um, who um, will be our final speaker um, in, I guess, three weeks. Um, we also, oh, I guess I should say this, we also um, have um, um, live closed captioning this week. So this is being done not automatically, um, but by a professional transcriber. Um, so we really appreciate that. And, I, and we should just give some... Um, um, some credit here to to uh, to Adam Shembri, one of our internal panelists. Um, um, he is um, helping to support this with his uh, recent uh, ERC advance grant. So that's actually just started this month on sign sign languages morphology. So that's a big congratulations to Adam. 
Um, we also have Bodo Winter here from the department. Um, and we have um, Jeanette Littlemore, um, who actually just today was uh, announced as elected to be a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences. So um, that's really nice for us to be able to announce that today as well. Um, anyway, without further ado, let's move on to Adele, um, who is a professor in the Department of Psychology at Princeton. And since we're talking about fellowships, also a fellow both of the Linguistic Society of America and the Philosophical, or sorry, the Psych Psychological Society, or um, I, I, uh, the um, uh, as well. Um, and Adele is really one of the leading cognitive <laughs> linguists in the world. I'm sure almost all of us are very much aware of her research. Um, she really looks into really fundamental issues about um, how la language is learned, um, and really, you know, taking the cognitive position that um, it's learned based on general cognitive processes. I'm also a leader in construction grammar, of course, um, and author of numerous books, including most recently, um, Explain Me This, Creativity, Competition, and the Partial Productivity of Constructions. Um, she's also a great friend of the department. We've had her here a number of times. She spoke at UK uh, CL last year for us, our Cognitive Linguistics Conference here in, 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 in uh, the United Kingdom. Um, and we're really very happy to have her back and, and honored to have her here today to give her talk, which is entitled um, The Usage-Based <laughs> Constructionist Approach Where Lexical Semantics Meets Grammar. Um, thank, thank you very much, Adele. Thank you. Um, it's really, uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, it's a great lineup of speakers. Um, I'm looking forward to all of them. And I appreciate your zooming in uh, today. You know, I know it's hard to be online and watch these things. <clears throat> it's also a little bit hard to give these things and it's nerve wracking not being able to see people. So um, I'm looking up at some of the panelists. Oh. Wait, uh, okay, hang on one sec. I would like to see. Yes, I'm checking this too. For some so, reason, um, I, I can't. I think we need Ted to turn off his screen and we need a interpreter. I only have one oh. of them, it's be my fault though. Hold on one second, sorry. Great, okay, no, I have this here. No, Let me, okay. um, sorry, this is, give me one sec to get this set up properly. I'm not sure why I don't see the presenter view. Yes, and let me uh, also. Okay, hold on, sorry about this. Okay, I've spotlighted the interpreter now. Um, Okay. Um, that might be. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so what we have right now, sorry, sorry, Adele, and sorry, Roman, for the for the technical issues here. So we have the interpreter here, spotlighted, but but not Adele. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hold on a sec. Sorry, this is not quite like we had it last week. Oh, sorry, this is not quite how we tested it. Okay. Okay, so I think what's happening oh. here is that Adele, can you go to your view, please, and just set, um, share your thing and then set to, um, yeah, so share, share first and then set to the gallery view on your view. I think that will do it. Okay. Um, okay, can you remind, oh, oh, I see, yeah, okay. Can you, does that work? No, I think we still just have the BSL interpreter up. Um, mm -hmm. I, I suppose that, I mean, maybe, maybe we should just go with that. So the interpreter is visible, um, but you won't be during the talk. Okay, I haven't actually, I have an idea. I'm gonna, um, let's see if I can do this. Hi, there's a there's a comment in the uh, uh, the chat which says go to view options side by side mode and you will be able to see Adele and the interpreter and Jack. Yes, I think we can only see that Adele once if you start your video. I'm sorry if you share your um your your screen. Okay, mm -hmm. some people can see Adele and the interpreter, so. Well, right now they can see all of us, but um, 
But once Adele starts your screen, it will just be the interpreter, I believe. Okay, well, watch this. Hold okay. on. <laughs> uh, um, I'm sorry, one second. Yeah, yeah no, no. <clears throat> Jack, they are asking you to switch okay. up your video doing the. Yes, sure. Uh, so the slides are being prepared. They'll, they'll, they should come on any second. Um, there we go. Okay, and there I am. <laughs> so. Oh, great. Well, okay. Wonderful. Uh, yes. So um, I decided to embrace this. Uh, these uh, wonderful colors that, that were chosen for this um, series. Someone on Twitter said uh, they're rock star colors. And I thought, okay, let's go wild. So um, <clears throat> I wanna thank Jack for organizing this terrific uh, series. Um, everything so far has gone smoothly. Let's see if we can keep that up. All right, um, so I like to start um, usually with a simple question. So I tend to think in very simple ways. And uh, if you start by asking, what is it that language users are trying to do? I think it, but the, the answer to that is revealing. So on the one hand, we all need to understand messages given the forms that we hear for the sake of comprehension. And we also need to choose forms given the intended messages we want to convey for the sake of production. Uh, and finally, we want to um, conform to the conventions of the speech communities that we're part of. I just realized this won't really work, but okay, I'm, I'll stick with it for a second. Because if what I, using it this way won't allow the animations to work. All right, I'm gonna switch back in a second. So given that simple observation, it becomes clear that we need to learn um, and use form function pairings or constructions. So I like to refer to the constructionist approach and I mean that inclusively. Um, the reason I like constructionist is because it, um, it's associated with two uh, words. One is language is constructed on the basis of the input and domain general cognitive abilities. And also language consists of a network of constructions so constructions are learned pairings of form and function. And what I'm gonna focus on today is the idea that we learn a lot of specifics uh, and we relate new information to prior information, extending it as we need to. So uh, constructions exist at varying levels of complexity and abstraction. And I'm going to um, go through some, some simple examples first. So it's clear that according to this definition of that constructions are learned pairings of form and function, that words fit this definition. So um, words like break or cap, one, artist, fifth, are all constructions. So let's look at the word break and consider it cross-linguistically. So Cliff Pye um, at one point had asked, he showed, he showed um, groups of people who spoke different languages, images that involved um, bubbles, breaking or plates breaking, sticks breaking, and he asked them to describe them. And then he cataloged what um, description people tended to use. And in English, I hope you agree that we would say plates break, sticks break, ropes break, but we wouldn't say clothes break. We would describe clothes breaking as tearing or ripping and bubbles pop. But in Mandarin, they divide things up differently. So sticks and ropes take the same morpheme and clothes, plates, and bubbles take a different morpheme. And in Quiche, which is a Mayan language, they have, a use, they have a distinct morpheme for each one of these meanings. We heard, we heard um, so, okay, the moral here is that we must learn specifics. We have to learn how this, how um, breaking kind of meaning is applied in each of these different kinds of contexts. Another way to see this, and you know what, I'm gonna switch because I'm gonna need the, um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna need the uh, animations. So we'll just have to do it the old fashioned way. 
Okay, sorry. Okay. So, um, so if we look at these images uh, in English, we would group three of these together and call them cap. And this other one, we're more likely to call a lid. But um, in Spanish, they would divide things up differently. So these three things all have the same uh, description, tapa, and this kind of cap, it has a different word. So again, the moral here is that we must learn the specifics of the language that we're using. And you know, this is not controversial that we, um, we also relate new specific instances to the prior knowledge that we've amassed. So that's the basic idea behind Bayes' theorem, and it goes back in psychology to Vygotsky. Um, so we relate new information to old information, and we also extend familiar information to apply to new contexts. So um, there's a nice experiment that Sammy Floyd um, and, uh, and um, Casey Lou Williams and I did that, that clarifies this. So if we consider those three meanings for, if we consider, sorry, three meanings for cap. So two are conventional. Here's a, here's a conventional application of the word cap. Here's another one. And this is, this would be a novel, a novel extension for English, because again, this isn't something we'd normally describe as a cap. We'd normally say lid. So Sammy got 40 toddlers who were under th three years of old. So they were under three years of age. And um, she used six polysemous words, that is words that have different but related meanings like cap. And for each one, she also included a, um, a non-English extension that exists in another language. And then um, these uh, toddlers were looking at these pairs of images on the screen. Uh, they didn't all occur in a row like that. They were all scrambled. And the toddlers heard, look at the cap. And when this one came up, they'd again hear, look at the cap. And again, for this one, they'd also hear, look at the cap. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna show you is the proportion of looking to target. So looking to the best, uh, the closest thing to a cap. And you're gonna, we're looking at the standard time window from the uh, noun onset, the word cap, to uh, um, almost two seconds after. Okay, and what we're gonna see is evidence that we learn the specifics, the conventions of our language, and we also generalize to the best accessible option as needed. So what do I mean? The um, pink line here is the English conventional meanings for each of these polysemous words. And what you can see is that children looked faster and longer to these conventional meanings than they did to the novel meaning, the novel extension in this, for example, the lid case. But also, you can see that they generalized to the best accessible option as needed in that even these toddlers looked more at the, at the lid, essentially, at the novel extension than the foil that was used. So given two options, the lid is the better cap of the two. Okay, so we learned specifics and we generalized to the best accessible option as needed. Um, I'm going to talk about a few different things, and they each have slightly different morals, and I, I'm going to explain how they hang together as we go. So um, we're still looking at individual words, and I know many of you are interested in, in grammar or syntax, and so we might ask, can studying polysemy, word meaning, different but related senses, shed light on traditional questions assumed to be syntactic? Well. I think we can sometimes. So the example of one is one such case. So there's a anaphoric uh, use of the word one, as in a big one. Um, and this has been discussed a lot in syntax. So there's a long-standing claim that this use of one has to refer to an n bar. And by an n bar, we mean um, something uh, bigger than a noun and smaller than a noun phrase. So where did this claim come from? It came from examples like this. 
So notice if you say um, it had me scouring the posts of cats like the one above, this one here, the anaphoric one, refers back to posts of cats. I hope you agree it would be weird to say it had me scouring through posts of cats like the one of dogs above, where now one here only, only evokes posts, not the whole N bar. So again, it should be bigger than a noun. So from this kind of smallish point, um, it's, it's been claimed um, to demonstrate innate knowledge of the structure of the noun phrase. So um, Litz, Waxman, and Friedman um, argued to, they tried to show evidence that, that even young children are aware of this um, fact about the interpretation of one. So what they did was they had 18-month-old um, uh, children look at a screen like this, and they would say, uh, look, a yellow bottle. And then they would say, now look, do you see another one? And they were interested in where the children looked. Did they look at at uh, the yellow bottle the way adults would, or did they look at the new bottle, the red bottle? And it turns out that the 18 month olds look significantly longer at the second yellow bottle. And they argued that this is because um, yellow bottle is the, is the best um, N bar available, that one here refers to uh, yellow bottle. Okay. But, you know, I think there's something about the pragmatics of this that, that does this without appealing to any constituent structure at all. So if you were to say, look, a bottle, it's yellow. There's no constituent that's, at, that's yellow bottle here. These are two different utterances. Look, a bottle, it's yellow. Now do you see another one? Uh, I, I'm, this is just a thought experiment so far, but um, my guess is that children would still look at the yellow bottle. It's just a thought experiment, but, um, but we do know, and in fact, we've known for a very long time um, that anaphoric one does not necessarily refer to an N bar. So you can get phrases that work. In fact, these are, this one is attested and we, there are many, many that are attested. Uh, and this has been pointed out by many syntacticians. So um, here's, so for example, the place had a sense of openness and appreciation rather than one of guardedness and competition. So this one refers to sense, but the smallest N bar is sense of openness and appreciation, but that's not what it refers to. Okay, so what is going on with one? Well, again, I, I encourage you to think about lexical semantics. So let's think about cardinal one, the number one. Okay, so the cardinal number one, um, clearly emphasizes quantity. So if you ask how many bikes does she have, you can answer one and you mean the cardinal number one. Notice it would be weird to answer that, how many bikes does she have by saying a big one, right? You wouldn't normally use the anaphoric use. But while cardinal one emphasizes quantity, anaphoric one emphasizes quality or existence. I should say all of this work was done with my dear friend and collaborator, uh, Laura Michaelis, who you see there. So, um, so if you ask what kind of bike does she have, then you don't want to answer one. That would be very weird. You instead would want to answer something like a big one. So Cardinal one emphasizes quantity and it often um, has a determiner like use. So it can occur with a head noun, like I have one dog. Anaphoric one emphasizing quality or existence again, doesn't occur with a head noun. So we wouldn't say I have one dog. I'm trying to de-emphasize the one there. So the difference I'm gonna argue is that the quantity one is stressed and the anaphoric one is not stressed. Now, why, okay, so um, why cannot, why can't the anaphoric one occur with a head noun? Why don't we say, I have one dog? I have a one dog. 
Well, I would argue it's because there's a better, very accessible way to convey the intended message there. Can anybody guess what it is? I have a dog. That is a. Uh. And in support of this idea that, that this anaphoric use of one has actually evolved historically and now blocks or preempts the use of it as a determiner is the fact that there's, there's a very common um, trend for the number one to be used as a definite article, right? Which is familiar to many of you. And here's a map from the wonderful walls, which is online. So the, the um, places where, where languages are spoken and the same morpheme is used both for the number one and for an indefinite determiner like a, are marked with this light purple circle. And you can see they're all over. So it's very common for the number one to evolve into a definite determiner. So what, what's my point here? My point is that um, the once we start to realize this tight connection between anaphoric one and the number one, we see that the distribution is really identical. Um, so uh, when there's no head noun, uh, both can occur in things like this. So a mere one or versus a big one. That one versus that one. So the, the difference is that when you imply the number, you have to stress it when there's no head noun. Just one of the dogs versus just one of the boys. So there's a different meaning there intended. So this is not that someone's acting like a dog, but that you're picking out exactly one of the dogs and has one versus has one. Now you might argue and say, well, you're asserting that they're identical, but, um, but first of all, maybe one of these you might argue is not the number one. But to make it clear, all of the other cardinal numbers behave in all these ways too. So you can say has two, two of the cats, those two, a mere two. Clearly you can use cardinal numbers in these ways. And the only case here that is um, in doubt at all is the first one. So people had claimed that, remember, that anaphoric one should not be a full noun phrase. So is this really anaphoric one? Well, to argue that it is, consider this example. This is uh, Lara's baby Shira, and this is Lara's example. So Shira has a belly button and her mommy has one too. Perfectly fine. Now, if this were the cardinal number and not the anaphoric one, we should be able to put the head noun in. But that's, Shira has a belly button and her mommy has one belly button too. Do you hear that that sounds odd? Shira has a belly button and her mommy has one belly button too. Cardinal number one isn't appropriate there. So why the fuss about NBAR? Well, I, I'm not sure I can defend it perfectly. Um, because the facts don't really support it. But I think what's going on is that because this use of and this use of one foregrounds existence or quality, quality is often provided by a complement or a modifier. And that's why you often get an N bar interpretation. So anaphoric one is simply a minimally different conventional extension of one. The number one profiles quantity and the anaphoric one profiles existence or quality. Like the number, anaphoric one can appear as a noun or a noun phrase. And the anaphoric one doesn't occur as a determiner because a uh, preempts or blocks that particular function. So the idea is that the, the anaphoric one in the singular is just a minimal extension from the number one. It's clear it's conventional. And in fact, we can use it, we have a plural ones that's obviously um, conventional and distinct from the number one. But what we have here is a case of polysemy. And once you start to look at the lexical semantics, the situation becomes less mysterious. Okay, so um, we're now looking again at constructions and I mentioned words, well, it's hard to define words. And part of the reason it's hard to define words is that words can often have open slots. So morphemes um, are the way 
a lot of us would view them are that morphemes are words with open slots. So um, remember that we learn specifics and we generalize to the best accessible option as needed. So we have words with open slots like, um, uh, like ist, um, like a noun with ist or a number with a, with a ordinal marker th. And this is product, these are both productive. So you can say not only artist, nudist, fascist, linguist, psychologist, constructionist, but you can also make new words like retweetist. And um, the same is true for the ordinal number marker. So we obviously have conventional fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, but this is productive. We can say n plus one or w -th or gazillionth. Now, we should stop and ask, why don't we, if it's productive, why don't we say teachist or actist or rightist? And why don't we say three, tooth, and one? -th? Well, I know the answer is clear to you. Um, and it's been long uh, recognized for morphology in the case, so goes back to at least um, Aronoff, that we have a better way to say these things. So we learn the specifics and we generalize to the best accessible option. So one is not accessible, we've never heard it, but first is accessible. So that preempts it. And um, teachist isn't accessible, we've never heard that, but teacher, um, so teacher is used instead. And so we have a, a full generalization here with many instances, and these are individual cases. Um, the same idea, by the way, um, is relevant to the to the lid case. So, when I explained the 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 fact that this is not described as a cap in English, the explanation was that we call it a lid, meaning there's a better way to describe this. But notice that in the context of the experiment, when there were only two options, um, this and something else, and the and the word was the word that was given was cap toddlers, and by the way, adults too, will choose this thing because it's the best available option. And the same idea that we learn specifics and generalize to the best accessible option also, by the way, explains this. So why don't we say, I want one dog? I want one dog. It's because we can say, I want a dog. And that, that has the meaning that we intend. So a lot of our work in our lab um, has argued that this idea of statistical preemption scales up to, um, to phrasal aspects of grammar as well. Um, so I, I'm not gonna get into it here because it, it gets a little complicated, but I, I'm happy to discuss it. Um, as Jack uh, noted, I actually gave a talk um, it for Birmingham before. And so there's a talk about this idea of statistical preemption that's already online. So I'll skip that for now. Okay, so we've talked about words and words with open slots. We also have unfilled lexical constructions like the noun compound construction. This allows um, recursive um, recursiveness. So uh, probably David will talk about this. Um, but just an example, Tuesday AM Birmingham talk series is um, an example of a fairly long, uh, lexically unfilled noun phrase construction used recursively. So just like we have words with um, that are fully lexically filled, words with open slots and unfilled lexical constructions, we also have phrasal constructions that are lexically specified or have open slots or are mostly unfilled. So I'm going to mention, I'm going to discuss this, this interest, this case that sort of captured my interest. I hope it's interesting to you. Um, but phrasal constructions that are lexically specified are, of course, collocations and idioms. So we say aunts and uncles. We say orange is the new black is a familiar phrase. OK, boomer is another familiar phrase. And there are many more. So I'm gonna discuss aunts and uncles um, because it provides evidence that we learn specifics and we use the best accessible option. So binomials are phrases that have um, two nouns with a conjunction between them. So, you know, apples and oranges. And um, 
the, the ordering of binomials, the word order, tends to remain stable across people and across time. So um, I'm going to tell you about a little study that used Google Books Ngram Viewer. So um, you can do this yourself. You just Google these words. So this is this is uh, the blue here is sun and moon, and the red is moon and sun. And you can see that the frequency of this is the um, relative frequency in the corpora. It fast it it changes somewhat over time, but sun and moon is always preferred over moon and sun at every time point. Okay, and that's true for fingers and toes versus toes and fingers. Um, and that's generally true. Fic familiar phrases very rarely change their word order. So why is that true? Well, because the factors that determine the ordering in binomial phrases haven't changed. What are the factors? The factors are well, you have to, for new cases or low frequency cases, you want to know which of the words is more accessible. So is the first noun or the second noun more accessible? What does it mean to be more accessible? It just means more easily retrievable or more quickly retrievable from memory. And the factors that influence that we know have to do with um, semantic factors like power or importance, frequency, length, those are all factors that relate to the accessibility of words. The other thing that matters is the accessibility of the whole phrase. So um, this is especially work by, um, by Emily Morgan and Roger Levy, who have shown that um, the frequency of your prior experience with the alternative order matters. Okay. So this general observation that um, you know we can consider all binomials to be subject to these two forces uh, suggests that we learn specifics and we use the best accessible option and accessibility depends on the relative accessibility of the two nouns and the accessibility of the whole. But this raises a puzzle and I just want to share with you this puzzle because I think this helps clarify how generalizations come to exist. So English speakers all say aunts and uncles. There's no question about that. But it turns out that in 1900, the uncles and aunts was preferred. So this reversed. So in what, you, what you're going to see, the male first binomial uh, is in blue, and the female first is in red. OK, so aunts and uncle reversed its order. Ma and pa reversed its order. We used to say pa and ma. People wouldn't say that anymore. We much prefer ma and pa. We used to say nephews and nieces. We used to say, uh, we used to say father and mother. But now we prefer mother and father. Not all of these phrases that um, all of the ones I showed you refer to relatives, and not all of the terms for relatives have changed. So brothers and sisters is still preferred. The male first order is still preferred. So what's going on? This really kept me up at night. Um, here's a, here are, these cases all changed, and these cases didn't change. Okay, hmm. Here's what I think happened. So early on, we had a very systematic across the board generalization that male terms come first. And we know that that, that tendency is still operative today for the male uh, term to come first. Interestingly, um, Hegarty et al. Ha uh, have found that it's not about gender, it's about perceived um, dominance or power. So they had um, people describe or people uh, name uh, gay couples that were given descriptions where one of the one member of the couple was described as more um, dominant or more male masculine like in a stereotypical way and who whichever person was um, described that way was tended to be named first but in 1800 it was a very systematically um, 
the case that all of these preferred, all of these conventional cases preferred um, the male first. And then at around 1910, a new binomial came into existence and believe it or not, was fairly popular. People used to say mother and dad or mother and daddy. And I, there was a ripple effect there. And that's because this case, I think, was a catalyst for the change. So first we have to ask, why did this case buck the trend? Why did this case order it, um, have the ordering female first? I wonder if you can guess. Why did people say mother and dad or mother and daddy in 1910? Well, it turns out that unlike in the other cases, in this particular case, the word mother was 150 times more frequent than the word daddy or dad. So daddy or dad was relatively new and mother was very common. So when this phrase came to be used, mother was far more accessible than daddy. And so it was produced first. So once that came to exist, then changes slowly started to happen. I think of this as a case of constructional diffusion. So ma and pa got sucked in. The factors that mattered were the frequency. So ma and pa was sucked in because it was relatively low frequency. So it hadn't been highly entrenched in the opposite order. And also semantic similarity. So ma and pa means the same thing as mother and daddy. Aunts and uncles got sucked in possibly because um, ants is also shorter. So it's less, it's more accessible in that sense. And slowly over decades, other of these um, cases got sucked in. Mother and father was relatively late because that was very high frequency. And so we've just calculated, um, we've just uh, used the, the uh, frequencies from Google Ngrams on 26 of these uh, cases of relative terms uh, and found that the strength of the cluster has an impact. So that as this cluster gets stronger, it sucks more cases into it. So now we can say a little bit more about what we mean by we learn specifics and use the best option because what when we say use the best option, that's determined primarily by our message, right? We don't, we don't just spit out accessible things. We, we want to express our meaning. But if we can express our meaning, you know, just as well anyway, uh, then we prefer to access, uh, sorry, then, then accessibility comes into play. So accessibility is determined by the accessibility of the parts, by competition from a different way of saying it, and cluster strength. So the increasing cluster strength leads to emergent regular regularities in language. Okay, and if we if we continue on, so I mentioned the existence of idioms and we talked about aunts and uncles. Orange is the new black is another case where this is this has become a phrasal construction with open slots. So um, this was on Twitter, um, but I like the example. So it's X is the new Y where the example is when COVID is over is the new inshallah. So inshallah, you know, is Arabic for um, um, we hope, God willing. Um, so, uh, but you can see that it's, a, it's an open uh, idiomatic like phrase. Okay. And this, of course, is not completely idiomatic. It's part of a much more general construction that we use for predication of all kinds. And there are many constructions with mostly open slots, and they also fit into our network of knowledge of language. Here's one that um, I just finished a paper on with Thomas Earps. Um, so I, I think of it as the gossip construction. So if I, if I ask you to fill in the blank, it's blank of you to be here what word would you come up with? Okay, I'm hoping most of you said nice or possibly good if you're British. Um, and that's evidence that we do learn specifics again. So I'm hammering the same moral here. Nice is the most frequent adjective that 
that occurs in the construction in American English. Um, and good is, is a near, um, is maybe even more frequent in British English. So this construction conveys a particular meaning. You don't really see it in nice, but it can occur with, um, it's horrible, uh, it was horrible of him to do that. So that's why I think of it as the gossip construction. Because what it does is it says, I'm gonna, this, this action reflects um, on this person in a certain way, and I'm going to evaluate it, which is really perfect for gossip. Um, so notice that you wouldn't say it's nice of the holiday to be on a weekend, right? That, that doesn't sound right. Why doesn't it sound right? Well, the construction tells you that you have to be judging an agent and that the holiday is not an agent. You can say, you can say it was rich of a viewer too to write that, but notice that rich has to take on its meaning of being ironic because um, you have to be evaluating reviewer, reviewer two on the basis of what they did, on the basis of that action. And to say that somebody's wealthy doesn't, isn't, isn't evaluative in this sense. But if you say it was, it, was, um, it was ironic of him, then you mean you're, it's reflecting negatively on him. Once you recognize the function of this construction, then it also makes sense of the fact that um, various things that we go over in this paper, but for example, you rarely get passive, um, passive compliments here. So it's odd to say it was terrible of you to get hit by lightning right, where you know what that's supposed to mean, I guess that, you know, it was terrible that it happened, but you wouldn't use the passive there because you didn't do anything to get hit by lightning. But if you can construe it, that the person did do something, so it was pretty stupid of me to get thrown out of the game, you're construing th this as saying, I did something stupid to get thrown out of the game. You have to construe me as a gentive to interpret that. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'm nearing the end here. There are, of course, argument structure constructions, and this is what I have spent um, a lot of time looking at. I'm, I'm still very interested in argument structure constructions. Um, <clears throat> I'll just give you a few because I can't resist. So you can see that we generalize. So if we wanna, if we wanna express something that's particularly creative and we don't have a fixed way to say this exact message, we can, we can get creative. So senators doze, fidget, and cough their way through history. Someone was suffering an allergy attack merging onto a highway and sneezed his way into the hind end of a truck. The airline industry could be coveted for years. Uh, you may as well fart your hands dry. And this was my new favorite. Yeah, sex is cool, but have you ever pss, 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 to a cat on the street and it came running toward you? Um, so um, in, in my book from, 19, uh, from 2019, um, I, I tie some of these same thoughts together. What I've talked about today isn't in the book. Um, it's mostly work um, done since then. But, um, but these ideas, I think, are valid. So we express our messages efficiently and effectively while obeying normative conventions. We want to speak like other people speak. Our memory is vast, new information is related to old information, and our representations are not perfect. They're, they're partially abstract or lossy, we, we, they're imperfect. Those lossy memories align in memory, that's how we get these clusters, and those are constructions. <clears throat> and multiple constructions are activated when we want to express our messages. They either combine or they compete. And mismatches fine tune the network of learned constructions via, via error driven learning. So, if we take a little, uh, this is kind of a silly thing, but uh, so an acronym for all of this could be this. But even though our memory is vast, it's hard to remember things that don't make sense. So, if we reorganize it, we can call it the sense me principles, where <clears throat> um, sense me emphasizes that we try to make sense of language. 
All right. And so um, the so that's what the newest book is about. My 95 book emphasized English argument structure constructions, but I hope to emphasize here that that constructions aren't only about argument structure. There are all kinds of things, often um, in, including words and morphemes and scaling all the way up. In um, 2006, I worked on more syntactic -y topics that were presented um, in that book. And I, I'm still interested in all those topics. Um, I just had to choose something to talk about today. So before I finish, I just want to give a shout out to all the many, many people who've influenced me and who are working on many aspects of the constructionist approach. So the approach is much more than, than just syntax. So a lot of people, including myself, have worked on particular constructions. Um, there's a lot of work on the diachronic evolution of constructions. So I just gave you a little um, taste of that with the aunt and uncle today. Um, there's a lot of work on cognitive factors and individual differences on semantic grounding. So that a lot of work in cognitive linguistics focuses on how we interpret things, lexical semantics and constructional meaning. First language acquisition. So of course, this perspective um, assumes that we can learn language. And so there's a lot of work uh, investigating how we do that. Typology. Um, so most typologists are interested in surface forms and varieties um, and um, and the kinds of um, the kinds of implicational universals that exist. Oh, it's going on without me. I guess I'm running out of time. <laughs> so, ah, sorry, I don't know why that did that. Okay, so let me just back up. Formalisms. There are many formalisms. Uh, Remy Van Trip has wonderful um, detailed formalism. There's uh, also, of course, you know, Ivan Sog had the most detailed. Um, formalism of any linguistic theory, I believe. And that tradition was carried on by Kay and Fillmore and Laura Michaelis. There's a lot of work in computational modeling these days that has a constructionist flavor. And in that I include um, this newer Bertology. Um, of course, we have to explain how constructions interact. And that's been the traditional topic of uh, syntacticians. So that's another thing that's really interesting in including accounting for island constraints and scope properties and so on. There's work in neurolinguistics, in lots of work in morphology, um, and in second language acquisition. All right, so I just want to thank my, um, my collaborators and my, my group at Princeton and my collaborators in and out of Princeton. And I, I will also mention that I'm going to be advertising for a postdoc. So, um, you know, if you find this kind of work interesting, you know, keep an eye out for that. And I want to thank you for paying attention. Okay. Okay. We won't go on. <laughs> I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I know that was great. Um, really appreciate that. Um, thank you. I, 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 I'm not sure if you presented that before, but the stuff on the um, on the binomials on the it was great on the um, Google Books stuff. It was really exciting. Oh, uh, thank you. And I, I just want maybe just say that we have a number of those um, well collaborators and um, you know and people who've inspired you here in the audience today. So that's really nice. Um, um, a, a number of them, including uh, including Ray Jackendorf and um, Susan Hunston and stuff, are all here. So oh. that's great, and it's really nice to see everyone there. Um, Great. Um, I'd love to just open up the um, the panel now for questions. Um, as usual, we'll start off with our with our external speakers, the um, the other speakers who will be um, joining us. Well, Ted, who joined us last week, and then uh, David and and uh, Martin and um, and Dagmar, who'll be um, joining us um, joining us in in the upcoming week. So um, I'm happy to open up the floor, um, and uh, we can get going with the panel discussion. Thank you. Would anyone? Yeah, David, please. Uh, thank you so much, Adele. That was really, uh, really fun to listen to. Um, so I had a question about the notion of extending the familiar to new contexts and the question of whether you can stop, when to know you stop, when to know to stop doing that. So the example I had in mind was your, if it's good of you to be here type cases. And I was thinking that, um, 
So imagine it's Christmas and I say, oh wow, it's good if it's a snow today. I think that's just about doable. I think I can do that. I can say, it's good at, or it's, it's lovely of it to snow today. I think I can do that. But I find it almost impossible to say something like, it's lovely of there to be a party downstairs or, you know, it's, so I find there's a difference between of it with one of these weather type verbs and of there with what people what linguists call an existential. I don't know if other people have the same kind of feeling about that. And obviously you would need to kind of test that in more <clears> depth. <throat> but I think it sort of shows that there might be a sort of you know stopping point to when you can't extend any further. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you. No, that's a that's an excellent question. So we actually did um, a large scale corpus analysis and we didn't find of it. Um, so I'm not saying that you couldn't possibly say it. People do say things that are overextensions. Like the kids will say, you know, they'll also overextend um, words and constructions. And I, I think what the answer to where does it stop is it stops when we have a better way, when there's another construction that's accessible that expresses that intended meaning. So, um, but, but I mean, so, in so my it's nice. Could, yeah, what was your example with there? Let's see, what would pop so I to mind? Two. So one was, uh, I mean, it, it, it has a certain, maybe it's even better in a slightly sarcastic uh, function, right? Um, you know, I'm about to go, I want to go for a walk and I'm like, oh, well, it's good a bit to rain today, isn't it? You know, and I have this sort of sense that that's okay. And my contrast, and, and that's maybe connected to your evaluative thing. But my contrast with that is even under that kind of sarcastic kind of approach, I find it difficult to do something like, oh, it's good of there to be a party downstairs tonight. You know, if I'm trying to get some sleep or something and I'm in a flat, right? So, so, so for the second one, you would clearly prefer, it's good there's a party, you know, yeah. it's great there's a party, right? So it's clear that what you would say instead. But and, why not as, it's good that it's raining? Works, yeah, okay, so what, I mean, that might be the difference that, um, oh, it's good it's raining today. That might be the difference, right? Like, so part of, sometimes what we do is we ask people, please paraphrase this. And we find that when people agree on a paraphrase, then it's evidence that the paraphrase is accessible and, and the thing that, it, and, the, uh, and the case that we're testing is judged to be worse. That is, if there's a clear, better way. And so if there's a difference like what you're saying, and I, I do hear that difference myself, even though I, I'm not sure I would say it, I'm not sure it's been extended that far in American English, but, um, but insofar as you're right, I think it's because for the case of there, there's a, there's a, it's a, it would be preempted by a different formulation. Right. Yeah. Can I just ask a tiny second little question, which was really, sure. which was on your uh, other stuff about, um, the ex uh, about uh, aunts and uncles and stuff like that, which I thought was very, very cool. Um, um, do you see differences? I mean, maybe this is just something to look at, but do, do you imagine that you would see differences in how dialects might vary with respect to how conservative they are in extension, in, in doing this extension? So you might see, you know, uh, some clusters of uh, geographical areas in English which haven't gone as far as other ones. And then you should be able to map out geographically a map of these things which should correlate to a certain extent with your frequency effects as well. And I wondered, you know, if you would, if you'd thought about that at all? You know, that's a really interesting question. I would love to see that done. You know, it's it's a little hard to do the work because there are so few cases. So like you don't have an infinite amount of data. So we we use Google Engrams, which piles all the dialects together. I suspect you're right. And there's a there's a there's an interesting, I don't know if it's gonna be significant, but in the last five, six years, there's been a downturn, just a tick that's visible in the figures, but it doesn't come out when you do the modeling that um, people are saying father and mother and grandfather and grandmother since 2015. And I think it might be like a backlash to marriage equality 
because the mm. people, so a lot of us would say parents, but people who don't say parents are more conservative and want that father to be, you know, the powerful, like that might be more, I don't know, it's just complete speculation, but it would be very interesting to look at. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. To see if there's a, yeah, dialect or sociological influences. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I'm not sure. Thanks. Yeah, we can map those for you. We could do a big Twitter map and get the, uh, you know, the 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 al the alternation between the two orders. Um, oh, we, we'll let's uh, let's let's do that for sure. Um, other questions? Oh, that's great. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Please. Hi, Adele. Thanks for a really nice talk. I really enjoyed your case studies. Um, I have a number Thank of you. questions. I'll, I'm I'm starting with with one that I'm asking for a friend. Um, okay. As they say on Twitter, um, <laughs> when, you talk, when you talk about uh, constructions, I, I really liked how today you explained that this, you know, lexical information really plays a, a very important role. Um, so, um, and then when we go on to generalize and abstract constructions from that, like you said, the gossip construction, for example, and then your formalization was it be adjective of agent VP2. So um, what do you imagine is real of that part for speakers. What's the type of knowledge that naive non-linguists would have represented? Um, yeah, that's the essence of yeah. the question. Well, that, that's a good question. So, you know, um, there's, so our, um, the function is definitely real for sure. And then the, um, the, you know, you can put any adjective that fits the right, that fits the appropriate meaning. It's not any adjective, but it's, adjectives that can be evaluative um, work there. Um, we, we tried to give it a constituent structure. We discussed that because, but there are actually two that aren't consistent. And so I think people could group, people can group as a unit either. So you can say how nice, um, how nice of you it was to show up. And you can also say how nice it was of you to show up. That is, you can just move um, how nice without the of you, or you can move the whole thing. So, you know, I think people can group it either way. I think, I think of constituents as, as lint, as contiguous um, strings that, that have a semantic, um, that have semantics, that are semantic units. Um, uh, yeah, so how much of it is, I, I mean, to be on what I try to clarify in the book is that I think that the constructions are emergent generalizations from the tokens. So I think we've remembered lots of cases, like, you know, it's, it's often stupid of me and it's often nice of you to come, like, you know, not nice of you to shovel the lawn or nice of you to make dinner. It's nice of you to be here is the, is the kind of phrase. We just learn a lot of specifics and because they're clustering, they're related one to the other. That's how you know the the constructions are emergent. So I don't think we have a good formalism, really. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. Okay. Do, do, you, so, so do you have a suggestion or? No. Yeah. It's 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 so. It's for you. It's more function syntax uh, semantic similarity, and the, these are shortcuts, shorthands that we as linguists use more than anything else. That's but I mean, I do think the form is important. I think the form is very important. I think the form is what the, the similarity in form is what clues us in that there's a generalization mm -hmm. here. That's the thing that's more co most constant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not just function. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Yes, Martin, please. Thank you. Yeah. Um, many thanks also from me for a very nice uh, talk. One one thing I liked, uh, particularly how you connected to a kind of a large uh, tradition uh, also earlier with, you know, people like Ivan Sag, Ray Jakunov from the formal tradition. You also mentioned Kiparsky at one point uh, uh, when you talked about morphological preemption or what Kiparsky called blocking. So uh, why do speakers uh, say first and second instead of ones and twos, and you said because they go for the best form and they already have uh, first and second, so they, they don't use that <clears throat> form. Now, for, for language acquisition, I find that's very plausible, but Kiparsky 
actually was trying also to explain why languages are the way they are. And he, he had this kind of idea of level ordered morphology. And so he mm -hmm. said, if a language has a particular form, it blocks it and it, the other form cannot arise. Now, that that is a problem that it, it can't really explain language change. So, you know, could English change from first, second, third to first, two, third? Well, actually German has changed. German has zweiter, zweiter, dritter. So zweiter is like two. So it's kind of mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. regular. So, mm -hmm. so the old, mm -hmm. I think in old high German, it was erster, anderer. So, you know, zweiter is an innovative form. So, so this is possible. <clears throat> How, how is it possible? On Kiparsky's model, it doesn't seem to be possible. Um, <clears throat> but uh, would you agree that uh, what you are saying does not really explain the cross-linguistic uh, trend then, that you, we need something else to explain the cross-linguistic trend if there is a cross-linguistic trend? Well, so, right, so I, I was looking at, at Walls briefly, and, and as I understand it, the cross-linguistic trend is that um, like first is often suppletive. And so, you know, for something, we, we know about this from past tense morphology, right? Like there's something came out of that huge debate. And, and that is that, and so I should say, I, I don't agree with Kaparsky's view of, of grammar and universals, but um, there are generalizations like you, you know, like you have argued and Greenbergian generalizations and they have to do with frequency and function. So um, like as Ted was, discussing last week. So um, so why would first be the one case that that is different? Well, first is used most frequently. It's it's, you know, we all, if we're going to have a second, we usually have a first. So it's going to be more frequent and that means it's going to get reduced. And so if there's going to be more chance for it to have a different form. When things get less, when things are less frequent, they're more easily changeable. And you see that, you know, in the past tense that like we've um, people have regularized lit, which I still kind of like, like lit the candles to lighted the candles. Um, because, you know, lit wasn't, wasn't frequent enough for people to remember basically, or for it to be as accessible. So people went with a cluster of cases that were regular and generalized. Yeah, so I don't know the history of German, how it regularized, but um, that would be interesting to look at, like how that happened exactly, but yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yes, Ted, please. So Adele, lovely, lovely talk. Very, oh, very thanks. nice um, summary of a lot of very interesting work. Um, thanks, and I, I love the framework and I love the the generalizability to uh, lots of language phenomena. It's really wonderful framework. I, I'm, I'm, I'm puzzling over the one case. Okay, so your neat Follow up with, I guess, Laura. I don't know how you say her last name. Michaelis. Yeah, Michaelis. Or uh, on on one, and um, I guess I'm not puzzling about what you guys did. I'm puzzling about what the argument was before what what you did. So you showed that there are kind of two meanings in a way of one, and and then um, uh, I don't understand the argument from the lids at all papers. What I'm kind of saying, I don't get you know, why I, that would mean it was innate. Uh, why? What was the argument? So I want to know why it's innate. What, what I, yeah. I'm trying to put you on the spot there, but maybe, or maybe you. I feel like I'm putting you on the spot somehow. I'm not really sure if I am, but I'm sorry if I. Feel no, like no, it's fine. It's fine. But I, then, I struggled with that too, Ted, because I, you know, in, in fact, in in the figure that he uses, the bottle is also an end bar. So like, yeah. I don't know. I don't know why he predicted that exactly. You know, well, what would be a case of of innate? So there's lots of these innate supposed. Um, phrase structure-y things. Like I know islands and stuff I talked about last week and you've done a lot of work on islands and stuff. So they're kind of, what are sort of cases from this other kind of way of thinking about things, which this, that's kind of what I, I was gonna, I was asking right. you, know, like, can you right. like expand a bit? Are there other kinds of cases? Like, so one maybe is not a good example um, of, uh, because you show that there, I think very convincingly, there's two kind of senses there and there's kind of two different meanings and they, uh, you know, that you get used. There's one no syntax. Yeah, the syntactic constraint isn't. Isn't really. It practical. isn't. Yeah, it, it follows right. from what we know about yeah. numbers. About, the, about word. Yeah, yeah, about the yeah. word meaning associated here. So um, what is it? What are other? Maybe it's not a question for you. So what are like? 
I, I'm often puzzling about this. I tried, that's why I go out, I was going after, I've been going after islands. I think, oh, they think these are innate. Right, so right. What, is, what are other things? If na- I mean, if maybe, maybe we're wrong and maybe some aspects of islands are innate in some ways, I mean, I, 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 it's a great, it's a great question. And I, it always piques my interest when people make a claim, especially when, you know, it's by people I respect. So like one that caught my attention was by David and Jenny Culbertson in great work um, that, that showed that it's harder for people to learn um, um, numeral, no adjective, numeral, adjective, noun, numeral order, which is also rare in languages. And so they said, maybe there's, they, they were agnostic about where it came from, but the implication was that maybe that there's a innate con, uh, restriction against that order. But I think they, they don't argue for that anymore, right? So, so Jenny went on to do work with children and didn't find evidence of it. And so I don't think that's a claim they make. And, oh, go ahead, David. David might yeah, I'm not the I'll best actually, one to defend an innate. It's, yeah, an innate I'll actually claim. talk about this stuff next week. Oh, so good. I'll talk okay. About some of it next week, and we are definitely still making that claim. At oh. Some, I mean, oh. I, I'm always dubious about the use of the word innate. I try and avoid it. I mean, I think really, I mean, everyone thinks there's innate stuff. So you know, everyone. I mean. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. It's whether it's specific to language. Right? Exactly. So then there's a set of questions, and and I think everyone these days and for a long time has thought that it's good to minimize the amount of the specific to language. I mean, that wasn't true, I think, in the 80s in Chomsky and stuff. But I think it is now. I think like, you know, there's a sort of quite set of questions about how to do that, but I don't want to take over your time, but it, yes. I, I need to- Okay, no, no, that's really good to know. Okay, yes. that's really good to know. I'll talk okay. about that stuff next week. Perfect, perfect, okay. Yeah, and I mean, I, I'd go on record as saying that's the, if, if it's stated as something like, grammatical category of, of um, adjective followed by grammatical category of noun followed by grammatical category of numeral is, is dispreferred, I would say, no, that, that shouldn't be, that should, that would be, that sounds like it's um, specific to language. So that's the kind of thing I, I would raise an eyebrow about. Lots of eyebrow raising next week. Yep, good. <laughs> okay, terrific. That's what we're here for. Excellent. Hey Adele, I'd like to take a question from the floor now if we can. We've got like a voting system. So this one's popped up and um, I'll, I'll, I'll actually just from Bing, Bin Zhang, I'll, I'll just kind of paraphrase, but he says it's a great talk first and thanks a lot. Um, he says, he's sort of basically just asking um, how, like, like what is the role of prosody in the whole picture of construction? So he says, it seems like your definitions of a construction or of constructions does not take the aspect of prosody that much into consideration. Um, especially as you begin with the construction at the level with, especially if you begin the construction level with words. Um, he says, I assume that words are the basic constructional unit in your eyes, right? And so he's just wondering then about how how prosody gets um, gets kind of in, in, integrated in there. You, did, you didn't like the difference between stressed one and unstressed one? That was my little nod to prosody. I mean, prosody is really important. It's hard to pin down and I'm not an expert in it. That's all. So don't mistake my not talking about it for a belief that it's not part of constructions. I, you know, another, an example where it is, is like him, a doctor, you know, where you, you kind of, it's also, it's multimodal, right? Like, I don't, I don't think you can do it, you know, without losing your neck and, you know, so him, a doctor, it sort of has to involve the whole thing. Um, yeah, and and I wouldn't say words are the are the basic units because we have partially filled words. So, um, yeah, and I I don't think it's all bottom up. Sometimes it's top down. So sometimes we learn, you know, I don't know, and it's a phrase. I mean, it's not necessarily analyzed as a phrase, but that's the unit that kids learn and use. Thank you. And we also have um, um, a question here from um, Tom Scott Phillips, who we were all kind of having a discussion with, I think, this weekend on, on Twitter. He says, uh, what what makes an interpretation more slash less retrievable slash accessible? Is there a cognitive theory underneath more accessible? Yeah. So, you know, there's that's a great question. And there are decades of, of um, work on exactly that. So what makes we know that semantic cues are the most are the best cues to make something accessible. And that's what we use when we speak. We we try, we find the words that are going to express our, and constructions that are going to express our meaning. But be, if you put meaning aside and you you use tasks that are very artificial, but 
but get at accessibility, like a lexical decision task. So how quickly do you recognize that this thing is a word? Well, we know what matters. It's frequency, it's animacy, it's um, priming. And, and um, those are the things that affect accessibility in language too. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll come back to the audience questions in a second um, or in a few minutes. Do we have uh, questions from other panelists? Uh, Bodo, Jeanette, Jeanette, go ahead, please. Yeah, I, I really like the uh, the Google Ngram study and I I, 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 I had a quick look just now and I noticed that um, right and left became left and right in 1980. There's a crossover there Ooh. and I was wondering, I was just wondering yeah, how, whether you know, how that would fit into your model, whether there might be a cluster of things. Yeah, so that's what yeah. I would look for, exactly. Yeah. Like, how did that happen? So left and right became right and left? Other way around, right and left became left and right. At least I, I just did it just okay. now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. And that's, no, what, that's I interesting. the power relationship there, sort of. But so yeah, so what I would do is, is look up, you know, right and star and left and star and see what other cases there are that, yeah. that might have encouraged it. Uh, yeah. That's where I would look, yeah. yeah. But thank you for that tip. I, that, yeah. Now I'm, you're, I'm going to be up now for, for the next few nights looking into that. There are some differences too. I think uh, mortar pestle, pestle mortar, different in American British English. I think maybe oil vinegar, vinegar oil is different too. I mean, it's to me it's mortar and pestle as a Canadian, but I think like for Jeanette or David to be pestle and mortar, I think that's right, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But I think there are some of those that do show these regional patterns. Um, uh, Bodo, Adam, any any questions? Thanks, Bodo. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, yeah. So um, I also was fascinated by the uh, English binomial study. There's just one um, question I had about the choice of the corpus, um, in particular with Google Engram, um, because people have been a little bit wary about that particular corpus because we don't know how it's composed. And in particular, when it comes to inferring historical trends, um, the, there's, there's some studies that have shown that the balancing of the uh, different registers is actually different across uh, time. And so um, while I'm sure that the generalizations you've shown are probably robust against that because they're really dominant patterns, um, you mentioned a few sort of smaller patterns and those could actually be due to the corpus balancing not being consistent mm -hmm. rather than actually time changing. Ah, uh, so that's a great, oh, okay. So I, I did start with Koha, which is more balanced, yeah. right? but it's so much smaller and so you don't get you don't get enough instances, then you can't trust the relative frequency. Okay. So it was a choice, um, but yeah, I take your point. Um, um, well, it would be interesting yeah. to, do, to look at both and see which of the patterns that you look at uh, survive the analysis with both corpora. And those would be the, the most dominant patterns then, I guess. Well, but the thing is that you wanna look at low frequency cases because they're the ones that tend to change first to create the cluster, but... Um, they are really gradual patterns. They're gradual patterns, right? I mean, that seems to... They're not like there's a big discontinuity there when something changes. So that would... Well, seem I use smoothing more. in it, but it, you know, yeah. it's it's with yeah. smoothing, but right. um, but yes, they are gradual. Yeah, and, and yeah. That one really stays stable. The, um, the yeah, brothers and sisters. Really doesn't move at all. Yeah, it, sorry, we, sorry, we did have a question about this on the floor and that was just... Is that published anywhere? Is that material available? Like oh well, thank you. I I it just got accepted in Frontier, so oh, it'll, wonderful. yeah. So Great. we're revising Great. it, and it should come out. Yeah. Good. Wonderful. Thanks. Adam, do you have a do you have any questions? Let me then take another one from the floor. I'll just take the ones here that have sort of popped up. Um, okay. Well, I got I got I'll, I'll take Andrea Nini's first as um as my own colleague. I'll 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 do that one. Um. So he asked um how does this we learn the specifics and then generalize connect to exemplar theory, like the Bybee, for example. Can we not just reformulate it as we learn exemplars and generalize by analogy? Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, I like exemplar models, but people, people, when people hear exemplar model, they think of a particular model that was popular in the 70s and 80s that treated each instance as atomic. And clearly they're not atomic, clearly they share structure, right? Like every, you know, each, each instance is a distributed representation in the brain and it's overlapping. Otherwise you'd have these combinatorial explosions that people worry about. So with the right interpretation, I think that that's right. Like once you recognize it's clustered, there's clustering, right? Which Bybee certainly recognized um, and, and Ben too, like, you know, 
Ben proposed that and then he kind of took it back. And, and I, I would have said, I, if I would have said to him, you don't need to take it back. You need to just clarify what you meant. Like, I, I do think there's something right about massive memory, clustering in memory and generalizations. Um, yeah, based on that clustering. I think that is right. Thank you. Um, and then I have another one here from um, Javier Perez Guerra. Um, he says, I have a question about processes of regularization of irregular in parentheses options. So thrice over three times, dreamt over dreamed, etc. Why does regularization take place at all since it apparently implies the rejection of the best accessible frequent irregular option? Does regularization have to be explained through the modifications of speakers' accessibility preferences? I would say regularization comes from the clustering. Right. right? If you have a big cluster, then that's going to make the cluster more accessible. Hmm. Um, and so we know that, in fact, neighborhood effects, like in those boring lexical decision tasks, they make you respond to words faster as long as the neighbors provide the same response. So like if the cluster is semantically related um, and you're gonna do the same thing with it, then having a big cluster is helpful. And that's why we regularize. And then why do we irregularize? That's because we repeat things and that reduces them. And then things don't just continually get reduced. I think there was a question last week that we didn't get a chance to answer, but clearly, I mean, we know that things get longer again because you want to emphasize things, you want to be creative. And so, you know, things once again get longer. Um, uh, I'll take another one then from the floor if there's no, if, if panelists want to jump in, just, just let me know. Yeah, Jeanette, go ahead, please. Mm -hmm. Thanks, I've always been really interested in your, your work on, on coercion and the idea of um, the words being pulled into clusters and then changing the meaning, you know, the, the, sneeze the tissue off the table and and like the potential for for metonymy also to be involved as a kind of device there like a cause for effect or vice versa and i was wondering how the this idea of coercion so the sort of pulling in of meaning how that relates to what you were talking about at the beginning of the talk when you're talking about extending the familiar to new context because that's that's about pushing out and i can feel like sort of two forces at work together here and i was just wondering what your thoughts thoughts were on the relationship between those two processes yeah, exactly. So, so if there's no better way to express that particular idea, then we can get creative, right? So, so all of those, you know, cases that involve coercion, like, you know, um, I haven't, I haven't thought about that paper, you know, or I, the last time I thought about that paper was three haircuts ago, <laughs> like a Fillmoreian kind of example. Like you're mm. coercing, coercing, you know, haircuts to be a time span. Mm. Um, and it's because you know you don't have a, a, a nice efficient way to express exactly that meaning, yeah. right? But but it's also encouraged because in English and not in every language, but in English, you've seen things like that before, where we have taken license, and so the cluster that you've witnessed has been extended, and now if you don't have a competing alternative, like you know, the cluster easily expands. So I do think yeah, there's this push and pull, and the so like. Um, variety encourages generalization and and a competing alternative restrains generalization yeah yeah so it's sort of like constrained creativity going on exactly it's yeah. constrained creativity yeah. exactly and that's that's exactly what language is right yeah yeah that's, that's right me. yeah thanks i'll take another question from the floor um well, this one just popped up, but I'll, I'll, I'll do the one that was in the lead a second ago. So this is from, um, again, from Tom Scott Phillips. And he asks, uh, what makes an interpret, oh no, sorry, we already done that one, my bad. We had another one from him. Um, another question, um, is there a desire to follow conventions over and above their communicative utility? Um, that is for normative reasons or are conventions simply slash only instrumentally followed? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question because I think that's really interesting. Yes. So. I struggled a lot with that. I, at first I was thinking it's all about accessibility, but then I realized, no, our judgments when we're asked. So for instance, we like, um, he made it vanish better than he vanished it. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know why. I mean, it's because we want to speak like others in our community. That's a, con that's a normative convention. It would be quicker. We would understand it to say he vanished it, but we, we laboriously say he made it vanish. So I do think that's a sociolinguistic 
Mm. fact that we want to sound like people in our community. That's why languages change, right? I mean, sociolinguists, you know, it's no surprise to you and to, to people who study, you know, dialects and language, you know, that's why, that's why um, teenagers are the ones to change language the most, right? Because they want to mark themselves as a different group. And then let me, um, so I, well, yeah, I got two, good, two really good questions here up at the top. So let me ask this one from, um, from Min Chun Xiao. Um, is statistical preemption always a case of winner takes all? That is, does the model of statistical preemption allow more than one almost identical construction to express the same message in context, such as light verb constructions, take a shower, um, or the denominal verb use to shower? I guess that actually links up just what you just said, frankly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, if you witness both, you 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 know, then both can be somewhat conventional. But I would say over time, they are going to have differences, and they're going to be different. They're going to have um, different functions. And I think the reason is that if you, it's harder to make an arbitrary choice, we don't want to have to make an arbitrary choice and flip a coin when we're speaking. We want one to win, right? Yeah, yeah it is a winner take all. Ultimately, it absolutely is because you you can only say one thing and you can only mm -hmm. understand it one way. It doesn't yeah, mean so other things aren't active along the way. I guess as a sociolinguist, I kind of wonder like, um, you know, like, like, is there, is it more than just marking off your sort of social affiliation there? And if there's not something kind of functional driving those choices and kind of lead, you know, kind of that's involved in the competition here. I mean, I think it's a real tricky question. I don't. Um, that's interesting. Um, you mean like, like some group of people change not just to be different but because it, is there some efficiency or benefit uh, yeah i guess or, or they have different community like quantitatively different communicative needs in different social groups and therefore this can drive oh. change but that's a but that's me just going off that's on interesting can, can, you want I, to can i leap into that yes yeah please it was just really this has actually been something that has puzzled me for a while about the way that you think about things adele and i've never had a chance to ask it i suddenly realized it comes off the back of this question so, I mean, I've done lo lots and lots of work with sociolinguists on stable variation within communities, right? So there's this work that I did with Jen Smith on Bucky, and there are absolutely linguistic variables that are changing across apparent time and across measured time. But there are other things that just stay stable. I mean, you just kind of, so classic cases are was, were variation, uh, that kind of stuff, right? So like- Did you say was, were? Yeah, so like we was, blah, 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 we were, blah, 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 we was, blah, 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 we were, blah, 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 right? And there's a bunch of things like that. <clears throat> um, and that's a special kind of community because it's fairly isolated. And so, you know, mm -hmm. great deal of, of interaction going on, or at least wasn't until recently. So my question is that if there's, is it the case in the way that you think about things that there's always a communicative or functional distinction that you expect to go along with a formal distinction? Or do you think it's possible, because I think it is, to have optionality of form without meaning attached to it? And, and th what does the answer to that question follow from? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, um, um, it, it, the function doesn't have to be meaning. It could be, you know, it could be about length or, um, you know, the it, information structure in some way. But um, yeah, so uh, my my guess is if you that there are variables that determine it. It might be priming. It might be something about how you're thinking about we like as a you know as a collective or like we each picked up a piano or we all we picked up one piano. Like, I don't know, but. I'm, I've kind of been struck by when you can pin down all the variables that you get really good predictive power. So I, I don't know, you, you might be right that there are, there are cases where there's just free variation and we just, and it's a random flip of the coin. It's possible, it is possible, sure. But it's rare, I think it's rare. Like if you, you, know, you can't find two words that have the same distribution. Mm. Um, I mean, that might be a case, but you don't find two content words that are in, well, I shouldn't say that, I mean, there might be, you know, um, kind of um, words that convey like extents or something like gigantic, enormous. I, I don't know if there's a difference between those. So would those things would be part, I mean, so 
that functional, imagine it's priming or whatever, would that be in the grammatical representation somehow? Or would it be external to the grammatic? Would that be part of the grammar or part of the use? So or, I, think, I think of the grammar is like the, the connections, the network, right. Right, which it, have strengths. And then you can have like, so I, priming I think of as it's a temporary activation, but it does have mild, but real okay. long-term consequences, right? Like, you know, the difference between, you know, um, temporary quick priming like that you hear a word. Yeah, you don't start, it doesn't make you say the word, you know, the next day, but it does increase the strength of that word in your memory. So, you know, how else do we have frequency mm -hmm. effects? So, yeah, I think it does have, you know, I, I think the dynamics of the system change on a small time scale and much more slowly and gradually on a, on, on a longer time scale. Thank you. Hey, yeah, thank you so much. I think we do need to wrap up because we've got to be careful with the transcribers and the interpreters. No, 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 David, it's great. I mean, we're right on time. And um, I think it's really nice to have the link to next week with uh, David's talk. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for showing up today. Uh, the speaker, of course, Adele, that was just great. It was really an exciting talk. We really enjoyed it. Um, the panelists, this was great. We had a really nice conversation here. I was glad we could get some questions in from the uh, q and I'm sorry, sorry we didn't get them all in. Um, and there was a couple on um, YouTube as well. Um, I want to just say we've had about, I, I don't think anyone can really see this except us. So we've had about 350 people here in attendance and then another 50 or so on YouTube. So we've had a good 400 people watching this, which I think is great. Um, and, and of course you can go back and watch the archive. Please check out the website for more information, um, including links to YouTube. Um, I'm really looking forward to welcoming everyone back next week. Um, we're really looking forward to David's talk. I, I think it'd be really great to kind of contrast this with the first two talks and, and maybe pick up on some of these same points for next week. And um, Adele, I'll be running you the uh, maps there for you on the- uh, Oh, that's terrific. Yeah, okay, terrific. Fine. Okay. Fine. And and if someone had, if people had questions that we didn't get to answer, if you want to add it on, on YouTube, I could answer it there or- yeah, exactly. You know. Yeah, yeah, okay. that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. thank you. Thank you. That'd be really okay. appreciated. Um, great. Anyways, thank you very much to everyone. Um, I, I really appreciate your time today. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Uh, just a question about the um, uh, about the the slides. We got a question. Someone asking about would the slides be made available? Do we have any system for that in place that we can uh, make? We, we can post them online if if, if Adele would like. That'd be fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, I mean that. Sure, I can. Yeah, I can. Um, I'll send you. I'll put a yeah. PDF online. Yeah, yeah, send okay. me a PDF I'll send you a link. I'll send you a link. Okay. Yeah, that's great.